It's time for questions to the First Minister and Deputy First Minister. And <coughs> I call Mr Basil McRae. Question number one, Mr Speaker. Uh, the FLAGS protocol was established in April 2005 by OFM-DFM in partnership with the PSNA, the Department for Social Development uh, Road Services, within the Department for Regional Development, the Department of the Environment Planning Service, and the Housing Executive to establish clear uh, working relationships and an agreed partnership approach between agencies with responsibilities related to the flying of flags. A review of the flags protocol was due to commence in 2009, but was postponed pending uh, the review of the good relations policy. A flags protocol working group was reconvened in December 2011 with a view to bringing forward recommendations on a revised approach to dealing with issues around flags and emblems. A draft uh, discussion paper was produced and shared with the Good Relations Strategy Cross-Party Working Group. However, this work did not uh, progress any further, whilst the all-party talks chaired by Richard Haas considered and made recommendations on matters including flags. The Stormont House Agreement, published in December 2014, commits to establishing a commission that will examine a number of areas including flags, identity, culture and tradition. The Commission will produce a report after a period of 18 months. Together, Building the United Community commits to establishing a range of thematic subgroups under the auspices of the Ministerial Panel to support implementation and take forward actions on the strategic priorities arising from the strategy, uh, one of which is to examine the issue of flags. We are currently considering options on the establishment of the flags thematic sub subgroup to ensure there is no duplication between the work of the subgroup and the remit of the Commission on Flags, Identity, Culture and Tradition. Thank you, Deputy First Minister, for his answer. It's obviously been in the works for quite some time. Uh, but would he be aware of the Northern Ireland Life and Times survey where 27% of people felt that they were annoyed by Republican uh, murals and flags, and 32% of the population felt that they were annoyed by Loyalist, Republic, uh, by loyalist um, flags. Would he consider the introduction of legislation to clarify the law in this matter, and would he perhaps consider some form of licensing to make sure that those that put up such emblems are known to, the, uh, known to society and take care to fly such emblems properly? Well, I mean, first of all, I'm, I'm not aware of the Life and Times survey in relation to flags, but none of that would uh, surprise me. I, I always wonder about the accuracy of some of these uh, surveys that are done. But the reality is that this is a vexed issue, as we know, going back many uh, decades and a resolution needs to be found. Thus far, collectively, we have failed to find a resolution. But there is a huge responsibility now, particularly in the context of the ongoing discussions that are uh, taking place, to uh, find a, a way forward which meets the approval of all of the parties in this House. Uh, I think that the business of flaunting, flaunting uh, flags, uh, whether it be British national flags or Irish national flags and people's faces for provocative reasons, uh, very unpalatable. I think it's not grown up. I think we'll, what we need to get to is a situation where we uh, recognise the need for maturity in terms of how we deal with each other with dignity and respect within our community. And that, that is the challenge for the Commission, which I referred to in the course of my answer, to come up with uh, ideas and proposals and suggestions, which I hope will find favour. Uh, among the political parties, so that uh, at long last, after far too long, we find a solution which uh, I do think, if we did find it, would find overwhelming support among all the sensible people who are clearly out there within our society, but who are clearly fed up with the antics of those who would try to use national emblems for provocative purposes. Uh, G. Shaw on the Fregration. Um, with reference to the Stormont House Agreement uh, commitment to establish a commission on flags, identity, culture and tradition, can the Minister provide an even more in-depth uh, update on where this is currently at? Gormagut. 
Well, the, the form and constitution of the Commission has been progressed and uh, agreed, uh, as I said, through the Stormont House Implementation Group. The membership of this group includes the main political party leaders. Uh, the remit of the Commission uh, focuses on flags and emblems and has required broader issues of identity, culture and tradition, and seeks to identify maximum consensus on their application. In its work, it is guided by the principles of the existing agreements, including parity of esteem. Uh, and as I said in my main answer, the Commission will pr produce a report within 18 months of being established. The Commission will, be, co will consist of 15 members, seven of which will be nominees appointed by the leaders of the party and the, and the executive, and the remaining eight members will be drawn from outside of government. So, I mean, I know that that represents, uh, if, if we get agreement in the course of the uh, present talks which are ongoing, obviously another delay of something like 18 months. But if that 18 months can be uh, utilised to find a solution, then it will be well worth the exercise. In the meantime, I think there is a huge responsibility on everybody within society to recognise that they should not be involved in provocative behaviour of any description. And that, that includes everybody. I, I don't single out any particular tradition. I think we all have a duty and a responsibility to ensure that there is peace on our streets and that we are uh, contributing in a very mature fashion to face up to a, a vital discussion around the whole issue of flag symbols and identity and about how the uh, traditions of all sides can be respected. Gail Collins Clare, Anna. Um, would the Minister agree that the flags protocol has been largely abandoned in some places with uh, flags proliferating, including paramilitary flags, uh, especially on arterial routes, certainly in very integrated areas of South Belfast? And would he agree that the rule of law should prevail and that those flags should be removed? Well, uh, I absolutely uh, do agree on, uh, on both counts. Uh, at the same time, I think that we all know the challenges and difficulties that there have been over the course of recent times with uh, people being unwilling uh, to fulfil their responsibilities in terms of keeping law and order on the streets in relation to the flying of provocative symbols. So I do think that the best hope for a solution, uh, in the absence of anybody uh, refusing to take up the challenge and grasping the nettle in relation to these provocative uh, emblems, is to find a solution through the establishment of this Commission. Uh, I do think it is ridiculous that we have in this day and age uh, a scenario where uh, the emblems of paramilitary organisations are up on uh, lampposts alongside uh, national uh, emblems. I think that uh, quite clearly the people who do that are people who are, are still living in the past and who have some, I think, warped notion that the overwhelming majority of the people of the tradition that they come from actually support this. I don't believe that they do. Again, I'll call Mr. Trevor Long. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, just in relation to Mr. McRae's original question, I can accept that the Deputy First Minister may not recognise the figures he quoted, but it's fair to point out his own department does use a life and time survey for their good relations indicators. My question would be, would he agree with me at all this leaves the police in an impossible situation in trying to enforce whatever regulation or law there is, and that the early imposition of a regulatory regime might be the way forward rather than endless thematic discussions and uh, whatever the commissions? Well, I mean, my, my understanding was that the Alliance Party signed up to the Commission, so uh, I hope that that, does, that contribution does not represent a, a divergence of opinion from party policy. But I mean, I, I, I think that I mean this is a vexed issue, and, and it is difficult in isolation for individual departments or even the police to deal with these issues. Although I do think uh, I, I can't understand for one minute why, whenever quite clearly paramilitary emblems are being put up in a very provocative way in the areas that uh, the police uh, don't uh, enforce the powers and the laws that they have to take those down. But at the same time, I think the greatest failure here rests with the politicians, all of us, because we have failed thus far to find a way forward. And I think that is the challenge for us over the course of the next while. The outcome of the Commission might not amount to a hill of beans, but I think we have to give it uh, an opportunity for citizens within society 
to have a mature debate about where we're going and about how we need to respect each other and respect each other's traditions. But in doing that, to do it in a way that isn't flagrantly uh, provocative and certainly isn't breaking the law. Thank you. And I call Mr. Chris Little. Question number two. Uh, Mr. Speaker, with your permission, I will ask Junior Minister McCann to answer this question. We believe that it is vital that the voices, views, and experiences of older people are heard and taken into account by government in designing, delivering, and the monitoring and implementation of all strategies, policies, legislation, and services which impact on the lives of older people. Engagement with the Pensioners' Parliament is a vital way in which ministers and officials can discover older people's precise needs in relation to the range of services provided by government and its arm's length bodies. Former junior ministers Bell and McElveen have, and myself have regularly been involved in sessions of the par Pensioners Parliament since uh, 2011 at its launch. Former junior minister McElveen and I spoke at the Pensioners Parliament in Belfast on the 20th of May of this year, and in addition I spoke at the, the Parliament in December of last year that was held in Parliament buildings. The then Junior Minister Bell and I launched the public consultation on the draft Act of Ageing at the Belfast Pensioners Parliament earlier last year, and we spoke at and held a session at the Parliament in 2013 to seek views on the proposed signature programmes contained in the draft Act of Ageing strategy. We are fully supportive of the work of the Pensioners Parliament as our engagement with it shows. In terms of financial support, the Department has received a proposal from the Age Sector Platform for the Department to joint fund the Parliament with Atlantic Philanthropies for the next two years, and this proposal is currently under consideration. And I call Mr. Little for a supplement. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I thank the Junior Minister for her answer. I welcome the support that she has given to the Pensioners Parliament. I, I think it's a, an exemplary uh, forum in Northern Ireland. Credit everyone who is involved with it, and indeed the, welcome the priority she's given to the health and well-being of older people in our community. But can I ask the, the Junior Minister if she can provide an update in relation to progress on the active ageing strategy and indeed uh, age discrimination legislation? Well, the active ageing strategy is currently um, uh, the consultation, as you know, had taken place and has been um, is ready for to go to the executive for approval. Um, we work very closely with the advisory group on that and the P commissioner for older people. In terms of the um, age GFS legislation, um, again, currently that is um, being processed in terms of uh, the consultation responses. Which won't be um, the consultation actually won't be finished till I think it's the 8th of October, sometime this week. Um, so obviously we'll be looking very carefully at what people are saying um, when those responses come back, and then we will be looking to, towards um, how we take that forward once those consultation responses are assessed and actually looked at, and then we'll be giving our response to that. Thank you, and I call Ms. May McLaughlin. Good uh, question number three. <laughs> Uh, the Social Investment Fund, during its uh, area planning process, uh, focused on the development and prioritisation of projects to address local needs, through which nine uh, SIF steering groups chose 55 projects to fit within the fund's affordability limit. Uh, delivery is now well underway. Currently, 42 projects with associated costs of around $58 million are progressing. This includes the three capital refurbishment projects worth $4.4 million, which we announced last week for uh, Belfast, North and uh, Derry. Uh, one of these, the Derry uh, Pitches Project, will refurbish community sports facilities at Brandywell, Lee Fair and Karate Road in the Foil constituency. Nine uh, revenue projects are up and running in the Derry, uh, Belfast South, Belfast West, Belfast North, South Eastern, Southern and Western SIF zones. Five are, are designed to provide training and work placements targeted at the long-term unemployed. All are recruiting their first participants. Uh, Derry's community work uh, programme has filled 34 of its 100 places. The, re the remaining four projects are designed to support families and young people. And a further revenue project due to start in the Northern Zone in late October will bring the total number to 10. SIF capital projects are also progressing. One, the Coleraine 
Rural and Urban Networks Charity Hub opened in September, and two others, the Bryson Street Surgery and the Best of the East and the Belfast East Zone, should also complete before the end of the year. A further 14 capital projects are either at the stage of design, team or construction, team procurement, and we anticipate that they will begin work later this year or early next year. Welcome for supplementary. John Corler, and can I thank the Minister for his answer to that and certainly welcome the good news for Derry in relation to this. Can I ask the Minister then, maybe to Deputy First Minister, to update us specifically on the Pitches project for Derry, which will help redevelop the Brandywell Stadium? Grimald. Well, the, I mean, the £80 million uh, social uh, investment fund aims to provide uh, improved social conditions and encourage economic growth in certain uh, areas where there is poverty, unemployment and dereliction. The £2.8 million has been awarded under SIF to the Dairy Pitches project. This funding will support delivery of improvements at three sports venues in the North West. It will contribute to Phase 1 of the Brandywell Stadium, which includes a new 3G pitch surface and replacement of the existing stand. At Lee Fair, pitch a new pavilion com comprising changing facilities and community rooms will be developed and a new full-sized turf GA playing pitch will be developed at Karate Road. Uh, and I know this is particularly good news for uh, the Brandywell and for football generally in the Derry area, and certainly for Derry City uh, Football Club. And I, I remember going to uh, the Brandywell as a six or seven year old to support Derry City and uh, that side of the ground, which is now going to be uh, transformed. Uh, it looks the same now as it was when I was six or seven years of age. So it is a badly needed project, the demolition of the Glen Torren stand. Uh, called Glen Torren because it was donated by Glen Torren to Derry City, and there's always been a very close relationship between uh, officials at Glen Torren and Derry City. That is now in the process of being demolished. So I think we're, we're going to see the Brandywell football pitch transformed over the course of the next short while. And that, that's good news, not just for local sports uh, and football fans in the area. It's also a good uh, regeneration project for the Brandywell area. Speaker, I thank the Deputy Minister for, for the answer. I wonder if the, he could provide an update progress on the, the projects in Mid-Ulster uh, from the uh, Social Investment Fund, and could he also uh, tell us when he expects um, when all the money will be spent on this particular fund, given that 79 out of the 80 million is as yet unspent. Well, I, I think that uh, the, the projects now are, are clearly underway in a very uh, important step change over the course of uh, recent times. Uh, we have seen, uh, in the context of moving forward on all of these issues, uh, a situation develop where because of the responsibility that departments have and the responsibility that the steering groups have within particular zones, we had a, a, a duty and a responsibility to make sure that money was being spent properly on projects which were going to enhance the lives of people in local communities. Uh, I, I do remember at, at the beginning of, of this process uh, one particular party in the Assembly describing it as a, a slush fund for paramilitaries, and uh, that has now been proven to be total and absolute nonsense. And I think that the uh, different uh, steering groups uh, within the uh, individual zone, zones, including the Mid Ulster area, are now focused on pr providing uh, projects which improve the lives of citizens and enrich the lives of citizens in a very powerful way. I, I write to, to the member about the individual progress that has been made. It would take me too long to go through the, uh, the Mid Ulster ones, but all of these are now uh, effectively at a very advanced stage, and I think great progress has been made generally throughout. Call Ms. Dolores Kelly. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. Um, Mr. Speaker, like the previous contributor, uh, Ms. Overend, I'm very concerned about the delays in terms of the expenditure. Uh, uh, can the, minister, the Deputy First Minister give us some assurances around the evaluation of the project, given uh, the failures uh, uh, that have happened uh, in establishing and delivering? And will that evaluation include detail around the number of jobs created, the number of people lifted out of poverty, the additional community cohesion, and indeed the amount of money spent uh, uh, on Consultants? Well, I mean, as, as in all of these situations, and this was a, a new 
uh, project that, that we embraced. Uh, there will have to be an evaluation of the uh, progress uh, and also a, a very serious look taken at the downside to the implementation of it. But I do think that uh, it's very, very important to stress that from the very beginning, the uh, intention of the whole process was to ensure that this wasn't something that we were coming along and dictating to local communities. What we were doing was that we were empowering local communities to come up with projects that they believed would uh, benefit them. So it was, uh, it was a bottom-up approach. Local communities had that sense of empowerment. They had the discussion, they had the debate, and they prioritised uh, the issues that they wanted to see developed within their areas. Uh, and that, all of that took a bit of time because it was new, and I think that there were obviously criticisms of how long it took. But from my report today to the Assembly, it's quite clear that uh, a step change has now occurred, that, that we're now seeing projects come to fruition, and we'll do so, do so over the next while. But I do take on board what the member has said. I think that we always have to look at these uh, processes to establish uh, how we can do things better in the future if there's a decision made to continue with this sort of uh, uh, an approach. Thank you. And Commissioner Dominic Bradley. Uh, since the, the end First Minister's statement on the 7th of September 2015, two meetings of the North South Ministerial Council have been uh, postponed. Uh, a meeting of the Special uh, European Union Programmes Body Sector, scheduled for the 18th of September, was postponed, and a meeting of the Agricultural Sector, scheduled for the 7th of October, was also postponed. A further North-South Ministerial uh, meeting in the North West to consider the future strategic approach to the development of the region, which was scheduled for the 1st of October, to fulfil commitments given in the North-South Ministerial Council and the Stormont House Agreement, has also been postponed. However, I would say that the operations of the North-South bodies are continuing as normal. Officials in sponsored departments are in regular contact with the North-South bodies to keep them abreast of the position and to ensure that they are taking the necessary steps for the continued effective operations of the bodies. Commissioner Bradley for supplementary. Uh, Mr. Speaker, uh, that was question number four for those who weren't tuned in. Um, and uh, could I ask the uh, could I ask the uh, Deputy First Minister, um, will the fact that the First Minister has withdrawn from the North-South Ministerial Council, will it have uh, an impact on the Council's ability uh, to reach the joint target of €175 million Euro, um, in terms of cross-border uh, collaborative drawdown under Horizon 2020? Well, I, I hope that it wouldn't, and I know that uh, civil servants, officials, uh, and I think all of the parties in this assembly are, are very keen to ensure that there is no financial loss uh, as a result of the present uh, situation. So I am working on the basis that uh, the work with Europe is continuing, and my hope is, as I believe the hope will be of all members of this House, that that money will be secured. Oh, Mr. Jim uh, so the Deputy First Minister tells us that the operations of the North-South bodies continue apace. Uh, can I take it from that that the um, funding streams are continuing? And if the Deputy First Minister's colleague, the Acting First Minister and self-styled gatekeeper, wanted to strike a real blow against the North-South bodies, then of course she could turn off the funding tap in that for 2016, she, as finance Question. minister, has to approve all the grants to the north-south bodies. Would the, would the deputy minister agree that that would be an effective assault upon the north-south bodies? The supplementary question clearly implies that it's not up to you to offer advice to executive ministers. Ask a question, and it's up to the minister himself or he wishes to respond to it. Well, I, 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 do, I do think that it is important that the work of the North-South bodies continues, and I am happy to report that uh, that work is continuing. 
obviously in terms of the meetings that are taking place which involve ministerial responsibility. There is a difficulty at this time which I hope will be overcome as a result of uh, what I hope will be a successful outcome to the negotiations that we are uh, involved in. Uh, apart from that, the members' hatred, uh, vitriolic hatred of anything North-South or indeed of anything Irish is legendary. So I think that from our perspective, uh, we will not rise to the debate. To the, to the debate. Thank you. And Ms Claire Sugden is not in her place. I call Mr Sean Rogers. Number six. Uh, Mr Speaker, with your permission, I will ask Junior Minister McKenna to answer this question. With your permission, Mr Speaker, I will answer questions six and ten together. We are aware of the provisions of the Westminster Child Care Bill, which will increase the amount of free preschool child care available to working parents in England. The Executive has committed to provide a year's funded preschool education to every family that wants it. A full-time preschool place is 22, 22 and a half hours per week, while part-time place provides for 12 and a half hours per week. The primary purpose of the preschool education programme is educational and focused on the development of the child. A positive consequence is that parents can enter the workforce. While currently there are no plans to extend the number of hours provided under the preschool education programme, this does not preclude consideration of such provision in the future. In the context of expanding on early career and childhood development initiatives, the Executive's draft child care strategy is open for public consultation until 13 November. The draft child care strategy has two high-level aims, to promote child development and to enable parents to join the workforce. Each of these will, in turn, contribute to enhanced levels of economic activity, greater equality and social inclusion, and reduce child poverty thereby delivering social change. The draft strategy proposes 22 separate interventions or actions to give effect to the Executive's vision for childcare. Our proposals will be finalised only on the basis of the feedback we get from a range of stakeholders, including parents, practitioners and policy makers. Once the strategy is agreed, we will take forward each intervention separately, supported by a detailed business case and implementation plan. Can I thank the Minister for her answer? Minister, have OFMD of M cons uh, had any further discussions in relation to Barnet consequentials from the implementation of the 30 hours of free childcare in, in England? No, I mean, the officials are, are in constant sort of, um, you know, looking at the, the issue of childcare uh, on, on the whole. Um, I'm not sure in terms of what you're talking about, the Barnet consequentials. I can come back to you and with a definite answer to that. But we certainly are trying to ensure that, you know, that, that anything that, that is sort of way in the Westminster government as well, our officials are in close contact with officials there to see how that can be developed and, and um, brought forward here as well. Mr Stephen Agnew. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Could I ask the junior ministers what's, what's been done to ensure that childcare providers are properly trained in the area of special education needs? Yes, well, I mean, the, the member would be aware, um, and I, I've said this before in question time, that the part of the key first, the 15 key first actions in terms of the child care, the draft strategy, was to look at um, specifically for training for people who work with children with disabilities. And certainly, I mean, even in some of the conversations I've had when I'm out speaking to some of the child care providers, you know, that is, is, a, is, a, is an issue. So there is actually provision made there for some organisations who, who deliver that, and particularly to children with disabilities, for the avail of money to train their staff to, to um, an adequate level so they can, they can work with children uh, um, with disabilities in that provision. Mr Chris Little. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Uh, given that the uh, cost of childcare for many families per month is, is bigger than their uh, mortgage payment at times, what is the Office of First and Deputy First Minister doing to promote the existing financial assistance schemes, such as the childcare voucher schemes, to families and employers in uh, Northern Ireland? Well, the, the member would be aware that we had a long um, sort of uh, consultations with, with people in terms of the, the employment the, the vouchers scheme that was our um, when we were also looking at you know um, the, the new the, the scheme is coming in as well with that um, the, 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 that voucher scheme employers for child care voucher scheme would be still available for people that actually have it at the moment I mean in terms of, of the overall child care strategy that is exactly what we're trying to do we're trying to provide you know child care in a way 
that it targets the people who most need it. And obviously, I mean, one of the issues, the key issues that, that's going to affect um, particularly families with children is going to be the cuts to tax credits that the Westminster government are talking about um, bringing forward. And that is going to impact on over 120,000 families here in the north. And in a, on average, each family or each household will actually be down up to £1,000 a year. So that is a big sort of um, uh, uh, part of, of that household budget taken away. So in terms of childcare, we're, we're trying to ensure that. But obviously, you know, there are other issues there that's going to impact on, on all of that. So we're going to try and do our best in our childcare strategy to try and mitigate um, as much as possible in terms, in terms of the, the cost that people have to pay for it. Thank you. Order, order. That brings us to the end of the period for listed questions, and we will now move on to 15 minutes of topical questions. And I call Ms. Joanne Dobson. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, can the Deputy First Minister give this House his assessment on today's latest media reports on the Lama Loan Book scheme contained in the Irish News? Well, I, I think that uh, it all provides very interesting reading particularly in the context of uh, a previous statement uh, that was issued, uh, which uh, denied any involvement in uh, the issue of persons seeking uh, funding for the work that they said that they had done. And now a new light has been thrown on it with uh, today's letter in the Irish News. I think the most I want to say about it at this stage is that it is quite clear that uh, what is happening around the sale of the Northern portfolio uh, is now the subject of a criminal uh, investigation into corruption by the uh, National Crime Agency and by uh, U United States Police and, of course, an ongoing uh, inquiry by the committee uh, attached to the finance department here uh, in the north. And it's also the subject of ongoing discussions in, uh, in Dublin. So I think these are very serious matters. And uh, I, I don't have any doubt whatsoever that over the course of the investigation, uh, new information is going to come to light and uh, everybody associated with uh, that project, and it was principally in the domain and responsibility of the Irish government's finance department and NAMA in Dublin, uh, will, will be held accountable. Ms Dobson for supplement. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Would the Deputy First Minister then agree with me that this entire saga has damaged public confidence in some politicians and business figures locally? Well, I, I think, as I said, uh, the, the public will watch all of this and, and be very interested in it. And uh, I think the public, like me, are more interested in the police investigations and what they throw up. And uh, I await, as a public, I know awaits with interest uh, further developments uh, in the case. I mean, the announcement uh, today, or the exposure today, of the fact that a letter uh, was in existence uh, on the foot of someone last week saying that they had no connection, throws a whole new perspective on what was going on. I'm not casting any reflection on uh, anybody whatsoever within the uh, political arena except to say that uh, I do uh, think that the investigation that has taken place is very important for the purposes of allaying people's concerns uh, that uh, things were happening that clearly should not have been happening. Uh, uh, I'm, I'm sure the Deputy First Minister is well aware of the strategic importance of the, the Shackleton site in Ballykelly for the North West. I'm just wondering, could the Minister provide an update on the sale of the site? Yes, well, we, we are very pleased to confirm that seven proposals uh, were received for the Shackleton site as part of the open competitive sale process, which concluded on the 2nd of October. Whilst the real measure of success will be how the purchaser of the site delivers employment, 
community and environmental benefits. Uh, receiving this number of proposals is a very welcome development. The sheer size of the site for sale is approximately 621.5 acres. So anyone who has submitted a proposal to purchase and develop a site of this size has demonstrated a genuine commitment to making a significant economic impact in the North West. For commercial reasons, it would not be appropriate to discuss the detail of the proposals received until the assessment process has concluded, and we will now undertake a detailed assessment of these proposals against the set criteria and look forward to this process being completed in early 2016. <coughs> Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker, and can I thank the Deputy First Minister for his answer. Obviously, welcome on that news, and also conscious that, uh, of the future development on the Brandywell site, which I want to also commend the Minister for. Can the Minister provide some insight to all our uses that, that are now being undertaken on the site? Well, I think this has been a public domain that the Department has agreed to license part of the Shackleton site to a local film and TV production company on an interim basis pending the completion of the sale of the site. It was, of course, open to this company to submit proposals as part of the open competitive process for the sale of the site. Uh, demolition work is now complete in preparation for the relocation of the Department of Agriculture and Rural Development headquarters. Uh, the relocation of DARD is expected to bring hundreds of high quality public sector jobs to the area and it will be a great boost for local businesses. In addition, NI Water has begun the process to purchase part of the site for use as an integrated constructed wetlands, uh, an environmentally friendly facility which would replace the wastewater treatment work that currently deals with waste from Ballykelly Village. So uh, this is a very exciting site and the level of interest in it is, uh, is tremendous. And uh, we have placed the emphasis and the focus on uh, the provision of much needed jobs for the, the North West. Uh, and given the fact that the Bally Kelly site, after it was handed over from the NOD, MOD to ourselves, many people didn't think that it would be of much use, and there wasn't an awful lot of interest in it. In fact, there was a lot of criticism for the uh, funds that we were spending maintaining the site. But I think our position has been vindicated, and I think. The First Minister uh, and myself have been to the site, and we always understood the potential of the site to provide uh, much needed jobs for the area. So I'm very excited by it, and I know the First Minister, well, the former First Minister, is as excited as I am, and I know that the acting First Minister is definitely as excited as I am about the prospects of uh, this site being sold to people who will provide much needed employment in the area. <coughs> You, and I call Mr. Basil McRae. Uh, can I uh, refer the Deputy First Minister to the Executive Sustainable Development Strategy uh, entitled Everyone's Involved and ask him on behalf of the First and, uh, Minister and himself what steps uh, we are taking to ensure that local government are fully involved and are actually implementing this strategy? Well, I, I think obviously the, the, the member touches on a, a very important uh, issue, and of course, with the change in uh, local government, the reduction in the number of, uh, of local government uh, areas from 26 to uh, 11, there now is a huge responsibility on uh, those councils to work in concert with central government here to ensure that we are uh, getting best advantage for local communities. So uh, our officials are working with the local government officials to ensure that this process has been taken forward in a way that delivers for society. McRae for supplementary. Uh, the Deputy First Minister will be aware that 42% of our citizens are living in fuel poverty. It concentrated in his own constituency, actually. And I just wonder what steps he and the rest of the department will be taking to prioritise energy efficiency in the years to come? Well, I, I think that this is uh, uh, a matter which has been treated very seriously indeed. It's, it's a pity we didn't get to the next question, which Stephen Agnew had uh, before time was up on the uh, first batch of questions, because uh, that, that would have allowed me then to uh, explain 
uh, what is happening in relation to uh, recognising the challenges that we face and ensuring that we are supporting uh, families to conserve energy, to ensure that uh, carbon emissions are kept to uh, the lowest that they possibly can be through new uh, processes which are now being advanced almost on a weekly and a monthly basis. And I think that uh, quite clearly there is a proposal to ensure that uh, grants are, are made available for families so that they can uh, take best advantage of these grants in order to uh, heat their homes. Uh, loans are also uh, available as well. So uh, there's, a, there's a pilot scheme which will begin, I think, at the early part of next year. And that will uh, pave the way, I hope, for uh, a much extended programme of insurance support for people who are living in fuel poverty. Thank you. And a comment to Stephen Agnew. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. And I hope I don't disappoint the Deputy First Minister by changing tact a little and moving to my other passion, children. And uh, Deputy First Minister, indeed the Junior Minister, may be aware of the report commissioned by Nikki on best practice and joint departmental working for children and young people. Um, one of the recommendations to make that work is that there requires leadership. Um, can I get an assurance that that leadership will come from the Office of First and Deputy First Minister? Uh, Junior Minister McCann will take this question. Yes, I mean, the, the member would be aware that we've had discussions with yourself in terms of, of your own bill, your private member's bill on this, um, and the, I mean, through our Delivering Social Change framework. That is something particularly for children and young people that we're um, really um, keen to, that works better because you know it doesn't it, it doesn't um, help anyone when departments are in different silos or whatever, particularly when, when we're looking at children and in, we have a number of programmes, early intervention programmes that are cross departmental, um, you know, I mean you have a bit of education, health and DSD may be involved in some of them in that and you know so I think and, and even in justice to a degree I know some of the, the programs in terms of the early intervention programs that we have brought forward have all been um, haven't sat in really any particular department and are very much cross departmental but you're totally right you know we need to have that type of structure we need to have that framework where all departments can buy into because that is going to benefit children and young people most in terms of delivering services and, and actually looking at, at issues and looking at their needs. For supplement. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I thank the Junior Minister for her, her answer, and indeed thank the Office of First and Deputy First Minister for their ongoing uh, cooperation with me on, on the work of my private members' bill. It has been beneficial and appreciated. Um, could I ask what uh, discussions, one of the key elements of the bill is around pooling of resources between departments? And I can ask what discussions there's been with the Department of Finance to make sure this element of the bill uh, can be progressed once hopefully passed through this assembly? Well, obviously, I mean, the officials have been in discussion in and around the bill, as you know. Um, a lot of that discussion has um, centred in probably departments that would have uh, you know, a responsibility for services for children, like education and health and the DSD. But also, I mean, obviously, because of uh, budgets, um, why we, it, it's, 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 we need the framework of working through delivering social change, but we also need to get it resourced as well. So um, there has been ongoing discussions. I mean, I can write to the, the, the member to give you a detailed account of any that has actually taken place with, with DFP in particular. But certainly, I mean, um, when we're looking at any sort of framework or any um, provision or any strategy even, it has to be resourced as well. So it's a very, very important element um, that we have that funding and resource in place as well. Thank you. And I call Ms. Katrina Ruyan. Um, the question I'd like to ask the Deputy First Minister is when does he think the first Syrian refugees will be arriving in the north of Ireland? Well, we propose that we should welcome between 50 and 100 refugees by December under the Syrian Vulnerable Persons Relocation Scheme with the expectation that further groups would arrive on a phased basis. Beginning with a, a modest number initially will assist learning and identification, indeed resolution of difficulties. And we recognise that we have an existing population of refugees and asylum seekers here, both from Syria and elsewhere. We will continue to work with the NGOs and stakeholders to understand the experience of refugees and asylum seekers and provide our support throughout. We believe also that there is a strong case for a refugee integration strategy to ensure a smooth transition between being an asylum seeker and a refugee. 
We believe this proposal would clearly demonstrate that we have the capacity and maturity as a society to react positively to a humanitarian crisis and extend the hand of friendship to those who are suffering. In doing so, we want to send a very powerful message about our support for Syrian refugees and our commitment to assisting uh, with this uh, global issue. Uh, and I'm very confident and pleased by the level of cross-party support that there is within these institutions for that approach. Okay, very quick supplementary. Um, well, Gaon Bwilkust and Fragor Shin, and, and I thank you for the answer, and I support absolutely um, work that's needed to be done to integrate fully uh, the refugees that are coming. Um, and I wonder, also we've said in a debate in this chamber that it needs to be underpinned by costs and financial support, and I wonder what, could the Minister outline any assessment of the associated costs? Well, there, there are a range of complex issues to address in, in taking forward this work. The coordination of these will be for the strategic and operational groups. We also acknowledge that in some cases there will be cost implications for departments and agencies. The current position is that the UK Government will meet the first year costs for accommodation and orientation support. They would also provide a contribution towards the education cost. We are seeking clarification about any health and social care costs which may arise. Current estimates suggest that, based on receiving 350 refugees each year, first-year costs could be in the region of £1 million, rising to £6 million in total over three years. So we need to consider, as an executive, how these costs could be met. Thank you. And time is up. The next